We got the idea about three, four months ago that it would be a very fitting time to, to um, review the history of our modern department that was founded 20 years ago, just 20 years ago. Uh, in, 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 in terms of 20 years, as opposed to this school, which is well over 150 years. So it's, it's, uh, it's really remarkable where we've come in the last 20 years, and I think we should at least celebrate with uh, these uh, to, to kind of review with some of the people that were critically involved in these past 20 years, in the past over Hundred years, in in where we have come from, and, and where we are, and where we hope to go. So I, I thought it would be. Uh, many of you uh, were not around when this uh, all occurred. I've been fortunate to participate in uh, over 30 years of it. So uh, it's been uh, it's been a journey for me. It's been a journey for our department. And so I thought it would be nice to do that. And we're pleased that uh, the dean is here uh, and Dr. Shaw who was very much involved in, in the, the creation of the department, and we're very much pleased that uh, uh, Dr. Purnell's daughter, uh, Laura Purnell, was able to get free from uh, her educational responsibilities with the Cleveland school system to also be here today. So let's, uh, let me just get started with this. I, I think it's, uh, this is an important quote from Albert Potts, who was the first full-time faculty member uh, of, opth of the ophthalmology division at that time under Lauren Johnson. He ultimately won the top award in eye research, uh, the Friedenwald Award, given by uh, Arvo, um, and for his work done here at, at Case Western Reserve. Um, he was an MD, PhD, and uh, did his residency program here, too. Uh, he, and I got this quote uh, in 1992 from him. He was now retired in Arizona at the time. He he was also chair of ophthalmology at Louisville. I asked him, could he was unable to attend a, a celebration for Dr. Purnell, which was he was nearing his retirement at that time. And I asked him for this quote, and I think it's very fitting to again acknowledge that it's, it's a characteristic of a mature department that it values its past achievements and records them without regard to personal social considerations. Only an immature or disorganized department neglects or denigrates its past with the aim of making the present moment seem brighter. So the department actually has been through various phases. It was, it was formed actually in 1893 uh, by Dr. Benjamin Milliken, who uh, uh, trained uh, and was the first trained ophthalmologist to come to Cleveland in 1889. And uh, he became an instant professor <laughs> at the school uh, because he knew something about the field <coughs> and uh, was became the head of the department, department in 1893. Um, he was succeeded. We've had really incredible continuity over all this period of time with only seven individuals over this over 100 year period overseeing the activities of the department. And um, Milliken, uh, Milliken, uh, trained at Will's Eye Hospital, and he uh, joined the staff of what became University Hospitals uh, called Cleveland City Hospital downtown. Um, and uh, as I said, was a member of the Distinguished um, American Ophthalmological Society. He was very much involved in medical school education and, and the whole new emerging field of ophthalmology. And, and uh, from uh, the textbook, uh, uh, the history of his, he had this quote, abundant facilities and appliances for giving full instruction in diseases of the eye and the various dispensaries and hospitals afford a rich material for the study of the special diseases of this important organ. So this was written in 1895 when ophthalmology was just becoming uh, a field unto its own. <laughs> He was such a dedicated educator that uh, within seven years he was appointed the dean of the medical school in 1900, which he held that position concurrently with him running the ophthalmology department uh, till 1912. 
So after Milliken, uh, uh, the department was then uh, taken over by Dr. Bruner, whose grandson is in our department as a clinical professor, also Dr. Bruner. Um, but after a 20 year, uh, and this was a very exciting time, those 20 years, because that led during that period to the creation of the Academic Medical Center here, what you see today, where the School of Medicine relocated from downtown here in 19, around 1922, and the hospital uh, left the lakeside area downtown to come here to also be on Adelbert Road. Uh, and that came about 10 years later, and this was while Bruno Bruner was uh, leading the department. He subsequently stepped down in 1936, and during the Depression, uh, a number of the surgical departments uh, became divisions under Dr. Lenhart, and uh, we were one of them in 1936. So after that, we had a series of leaders uh, as uh, under the divisional structure working under the Department of Surgery, including uh, Bruner's um, nephew, uh, Abram Bruner, uh, followed by Lauren Johnson, who trained at Mass Ioneer and came to uh, Cleveland and recruited Dr. Potts as, as the first full-time faculty. He also, uh, under Bruner, going back, the residency program uh, recruited Dr. Thomas, uh, was the first resident who ultimately became chairman in 1961. But we're gonna focus on particularly Thomas Purnell and Purnell, which re really set up the elements for us to again become a department in 1991. So under Dr. Thomas, uh, Dr. Purnell had been a, a medical school graduate here, stayed on uh, in, in residency, was involved in the Navy, uh, Princeton trained engineer. Uh, Dr. Thomas was very supportive of Dr. Purnell's career, established his laboratory in, ultra, uh, in ophthalmic ultrasound, which became internationally recognized and really was the father of the, of the development of ophthalmic ultrasound. Uh, Thomas also recruited Dr. Keene, uh, who had an over 25 year of continuous funding from the National Eye Institute uh, studying rhodopsin biochemistry. Um, he recruited some other faculty which were really key in, in also in the development of our department, including Dr. Reinhardt, who was a resident here, Dr. Cappard, who led uh, Metro and is, has now assumed that again, and Dr. Frank. I mentioned these faculty because these were faculty that ultimately uh, contributed to uh, the new department when it was formed in, in 91. So um, besides uh, his accomplishments in ultrasonography, he was also a member of the American Ophthalmological Society, very much dedicated to resident education, and really uh, led to the integration of, of our affiliated hospital programs with Metro and with the VA. Nearing his retirement, in discussions with him, with the school, with Dr. Shuck, the dean, etc., uh, the, the the feeling was we had a sufficient critical mass of clinical research and teaching efforts to again, which he had assembled and that really was started under Dr. Thomas, to create a separate department of ophthalmology again, 1936 to 1991. It was supposed to be a short experiment. It lasted over 50 years. So. Um, this was um, a, a, a one, one ceremony nearing his retirement with uh, Laura and her, uh, her mother Marge and, and Ed uh, uh, Holosek, who was Dr. Purnell's very close associate. So this was around the time the discussions for the department to be formed. Purnell recruited a number of faculty that also contributed to that department besides Dr. Reinhardt and uh, Capper, et cetera. He recruited me in 1979, uh, Dr. Bernie, Dr. Yanagloss, Schottke, and Bardenstein. Um, and this was a, a, f a picture in the early 90s, just as the department was forming uh, with Dr. Purnell. So there were really four, four individuals that really uh, were very supportive of us to become a separate department, including Dean Cherniak, uh, who uh, uh, was, uh, uh, over, already was overseeing a separation of uh, uh, urology also and neurosurgery at the same time, President Pitta, who was the president of the university at the time, 
Dr. Shuck, who is the chair of surgery, which was a, a key, and he has some comments about that, and, and Mrs. Walters, who was at the time was president of, of the hospital. And one of the leading f reasons for us to become a department were discussions over many years with David Weeks, who was the head of RPB, Research to Prevent Blindness, for us that we would not, where this RPB was formed in the early 60s and also was, was really a, a, a very important in the formation of the National Eye Institute as an advocacy group and um, uh, led by Dr. Jules Stein and David Weeks. Um, um, and yet we were sitting on the sidelines because we could not get funding from RPB because we were a division. So this was a, a major impetus for us to become a department. Um, and. Um, and so uh, after we did become a department, uh, when we were voted by the university, we had to wait. We had to have a permanent chairman, which did not come until actually 1994 when I was made permanent chairman. We had to wait further. We went into a, a pro provisional status, and ultimately we achieved uh, unrestricted full funding in 1997, six years after we had become a department. And, and this, so this planning of becoming a department had, was huge for us in that uh, since that 1997, we received nearly $3 million of funding uh, from RPB, either as an unrestricted award to, to me. Uh, we've received some of the major in individual awards, including the Jules Stein Professorship for Dr. Pikaleva, senior awards, junior awards, and even medical student awards, which has been immensely helpful. We have one uh, now with Sixto Leal. Um, the department grew in 1994, that, that traditional uh, picture on Lakeside, uh, which we just took last week, uh, this week, uh, has, has grown over this period of time. We've added additional faculty uh, in all the subspecialty areas, and uh, we've expanded our clinical facilities, uh, both our office and surgical locations, and our residency training, uh, which is the core of our program, has expanded with mergers of two other hospitals, so we have 18 residents now, uh, one of the top residency programs in terms of size and quality, and our, our, our graduates are all over the world now, uh, over 250, 275 trained. Um, and this was due to mergers with Mount Sinai and St. Luke's. We've now initiated this research day and uh, four years ago, and now a research requirement, and, and uh, the quality of our, of our residency research has really reached a stage that we felt it would be helpful for all of you to see what our residents are doing as part of this symposium. And more recently, we've uh, expanded our, our residency training uh, with uh, new facilities at the VA. The um, impetus of, of today is on research, and uh, we've really had great leaders in terms of both basic and clinical research with Dr. Perlman, our basic research director, and, and our vice chair, uh, Subar Wong, for leading our clinical research efforts. We started uh, uh, in our fairly early stages here uh, with Dr. Perlman, um, fuzzy, uh, uh, his fuzzy self with Dr. Bardenstein and myself with uh, Dr. Di uh, with uh, Eugenia uh, Diacono, uh, who was our, our uh, tremendous uh, research assistant for many years in Perlman's lab. <coughs> But from there, we've really now have six basic scientists within uh, with primary appointments and have associations which have been very valuable with secondary appointments in, in these other departments. <laughs> And um, we've really focused over these years, since we became a department, on infrastructure development, really with the support of both the School of Medicine and, and University Hospitals. And some of the, th the uh, infrastructure support was our R21 grant, developing our clinical trials unit, uh, our, for our joining uh, the hospital in support of the full-time faculty employed by the hospital uh, with a group called UA University Hospitals Medical Group. But particularly important for today, 
today has been the, the growth of our basic science infrastructure um, with uh, our, our laboratories, which were established in 2007 under Dean Horowitz with the support of the research director at that time, Vice Dean uh, uh, Dr. Davis, who, who, who subsequently became dean. And, and, and also, I should point out the, the tremendous support of university hospitals through the case research into me, uh, Institute Mechanism and Dr. Rothstein and certainly philanthropy. And as a result of the growth of all, all these programs, clinical teaching and research, this led to us being constituted by the hospital as an eye institute uh, in 2008, uh, uniting our clinical programs in, in anterior segment disease, retina, and pediatric with all the basic and clinical research programs and our teaching programs, not just for uh, medical students, but graduate students students, postdoctoral fellows, etc. And this was actually recognized very nicely at the 10th anniversary of this symposium three years ago when, when, the, the, when the director of the National Institute uh, came and, and appeared before this group, uh, Dr. Sieving. I think the proudest thing that I've had as chair, as, as, a, as the new department, has been the promotion of our faculty to, uh, to the full professor rank uh, at you know, one of the top research intensive universities in the country. Uh, so they have, they have, they have uh, withstood the review process and reached this, this rank of, of full professor, uh, including doctors Bardenstein, Bernie, Wong, Reinhardt, and Schottke most recently, and uh, Dr. Dr. Nagraj and Perlman. And we hope our junior faculty uh, can follow in, in, uh, in their footsteps. I should mention to close, our efforts have been very much supported by the other basic science and other clinical departments that have, have participated in our Visual Sciences Research Center, which um, we're very appreciative of, of Dean Berger, who remains active on the faculty. Uh, I uh, approached him in 1996 that we really had a critical mass of vision investigators, not just within ophthalmology, but other departments. Um, the departments have changed, their emphasis has changed. At this point, uh, obviously pharmacology is a leader in, in vision research, and uh, but it varied. At, at that time, neurology was actually a very strong neuro, neuro, neurosciences. But the concept of collaboration of our, of our basic and clinical departments still is there. The principle is there. We have the science changes, the individuals change, but the, the importance of collaboration is, couldn't be even more important. Than, than ever now. So we have the structure in place, and that led to the P30 core grant, which you heard from Dr. Perlman, uh, the unrestricted uh, uh, RPB funding. And, and actually, most recently, RPB now uh, has agreed that a basic scientist that has uh, a relationship with the ophthalmology department can now apply for RPB funding with a new grant program. So Dr. Iyengar will be the first uh, scientist a mid-level scientist who's going to be applying to this grant. It's a new grant program that RPB has just funded, um, and probably with the assistance of Dr. Palczewski, who is on their advisory council. We subsequently got a T32 training grant under Dr. Porter, um, and these are the departments you've seen or have been involved. This has been immensely helpful both for ophthalmology but for the basic science departments for the school as a whole, where our funding in 1993 was a little over $5 million, and in 2010 it is approaching about uh, approximately $9 million and, and probably even higher this year. Um, Lastly, uh, philanthropy is obviously a very important part of all this, and and we're mostly uh, we're most grateful for uh, those families, grateful patients, supporters of the school who have, have endowed major gifts to the to the to the department to support its re particularly its research and teaching efforts. I'm particularly uh, grateful to Dr. Asif. We, the first chair was the Thomas Chair, which was established by a grateful patient in the 1960s. 
1970s, which I, which I hold. But uh, we, there had been more than 20 years from that chair being established that we had not had another major gift of this kind. And we're very appreciative that Dr. Peter Asif, who was a research uh, director at Lubrizol, and his son was an, uh, is an ophthalmologist on our faculty and, and endowed a chair uh, for uh, vision research, particularly in the area of retinal diseases. Um, in um, in 2000, and the first holder of that was actually John Porter, uh, who's now at, at um, NID, uh, uh, NIDDK. Um, and now uh, Ram Nagaraj is, is the holder of that chair. But this was really a catalyst for other major gifts. He uh, asked that with that chair that $750,000 be matched, which we achieved that. And we have had subsequently two additional chairs, the Searle Wong professorship um, that Dr. Wong holds. And, and most recently, uh, the Paige Reinhardt Chair, which we've now made a recommendation to the school and the university that Dr. Perlman uh, be appointed to that, that chair. We've also received other, other major gifts. So it's been... Uh, it's been a journey from a department and, and being, playing a, a very key role in the development of the academic medical center in the uh, turn of the 20th century. And now we, we believe now at the 21st century that our, our new department after 20 years can also play a major role in the growth of all the academic programs, our clinical teaching and research programs here at Case Western Reserve University and University Hospital's Case Medical Center. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, introduce next uh, Jerry Shuka. He's been here about as long as I've been. And uh, he was chair of surgery for, wow, at least about 20 years? 21 years. 21 years. And, uh, and it remains a professor of surgery and uh, is playing a huge role in graduate medical education now at University Hospitals as the head of GME. And he was kind enough to come today and also participate in our nostalgic uh, experience here. As one uh, enters antiquity, one gets to be nostalgic. Uh, the uh, uh, Next week, we'll be introducing all of the new residents at orientation time. And I usually tell them it's OK. There's life behind, beyond residency. As a PGY 52, I'm not having any problems, and uh, they, they won't either. Uh, Jonathan wanted me to talk a little bit about what really happened back in the 1980s. I uh, was recruited, uh, I don't know many uh, Nobel laureates, but, uh, uh, but I was recruited by our dean, who was a Nobel laureate in 79, to come here. Uh, the chair was open for five years, and I became chairman of surgery in January 1980. At that time, it was a huge department in terms of divisions. There was general surgery, plastic, all in surgery. Ophthalmology, neurosurgery, urology, ENT, cardiothoracic. Uh, I had them all. I was the capo de tutti capi. Anyhow, it was, uh, it was an exciting time. I was asked uh, as if it was an easy thing, just make a practice plan and get all these people together. Everybody had their own corporation and uh, make it all work. And uh, for that, you can be our chairman. Uh, I said, sure. Uh, at that time, uh, the chiefs of the divisions and departments at Metro were not ever, there were no chairs at Metro. And uh, they were always vice chairs. So I recruited for Metro, recruited for the VA. And within a few years, I changed all the division chiefs. So I had a few people who was happy I was here. The, uh, Early in that 1980s, uh, Ed Purnell, I, I took him aside. Now, those of you who knew Ed, uh, this is a gentle, kind person. Uh, he never tooted his horn. Uh, he quietly did the things he needed to do. He was always supportive in his quiet way for the people who depended upon him. And I, I was crazy about this guy, but I, I said, Ed, this is bizarre. I don't, at this point, know any departments of surgery that still has ophthalmology. 
why are you still a division? And it was like he said it yesterday, Jerry, the only issue I have is I don't want to deal with deans and hospital presidents. I want you to do that. And that's exactly what he told me. Well, we let it go for a while. And at that point, we had a lot of people jumping ship. Uh, every time you recruited at that point a new chief of a division, they said, we're going to be a department and we can't have a chief. Uh, a little bit of coercion. Uh, so uh, ENT dropped off, neuros neurosurgery dropped out, they became a separate department, urology, and I recruited all the chiefs. And so we were pretty good friends at the time. And uh, they all became departments. And so ophthalmology was looking for a new chief when Ed said, I want out. It was very apparent that uh, we are recording this so we can uh, Oh. Can I throw it against the wall? <laughs> I'll start pushing buttons, I guess. I pushed the button. I have no idea. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and so it became apparent to me and had been apparent for a long time that we should have a department. And uh, I sat down with Ed and, uh, uh, and Jonathan, who was clearly uh, one of the key players here. He was a rising star. He had energy. My attraction to Jonathan really had nothing to do with ophthalmology. I love to listen to him play foray on the uh, cello. Uh, we've even recently uh, gone to a ball game. He actually got a foul b of a ball, and I never did. Uh, and I've, I'm holding that against him. But the uh, but it, it worked pretty well. And he said, "We'll be a department." Well, by that time in the early 1990s, everybody got their freedom. You know, from the oppressor, it's kind of like uh, Arab Spring. Uh, and so everything seemed to go well. And so I'm reminded of a comment Winston Churchill made when they lost India. He said that he didn't want to preside over an empire that was uh, dissembling. Uh, and I guess that's what I did. But there were some benefits to that. There's some real benefits to that, and that is every one of these people I personally had a very good relationship with. So now when we sat down at the table with the leaders of either the hospital or the medical school, we had a whole bunch of people uh, who uh, were part of what we saw as kind of a, a surgical uh, mafia. And that was always very helpful, very supportive. And uh, let me just, the, uh, the only other point I'd like to make is the success that I've observed with ophthalmology. Uh, you've heard it all just now, uh, but it always makes you feel good uh, to be part of and part of the establishment of something of this quality. Uh, and uh, and I, I know how that feels. I, I could identify with Jonathan when he saw people who've been promoted to high positions under his uh, mentorship. And, and that's the reward system, and it feels good. It feels very good, and you ought to be very proud. Uh, this is a wonderful symposium. Uh, I have not understood one paper, uh, but it's, I'm not paid to understand those papers. Uh, but, I'm, uh, but I'm very impressed with what's going on here. You should all be very proud, and it's a very fitting birthday party. Thank you. We're very pleased that the uh, dean uh, of, of our School of Medicine, uh, Pamela Davis, is also here to uh, offer some remarks uh, about the department um, 20th anniversary. So thank you, Dr. Lass. Uh, uh, 
Jonathan has been modest about his own contributions to the development of this department. Uh, although the department's been around for over 100 years, really Jonathan has been its guiding light over, the, over its current iteration of the department in the last uh, 20 years, and as Thomas Chair, he has guided it well. Uh, there's so much we can be proud of in this department. 20 years ago when we started the department, did we possibly imagine that a new approach to curing onchocerciasis would come out of here by focusing not on the worm, but on the worm's infections? Uh, did we imagine that age-related macular degeneration research would lead to studies on Alzheimer's disease? Did we imagine that uh, in collaboration with the Department of Pharmacology, we would be approaching cures of Leber congenital amaurosis or Stargardt's disease? Did we imagine that so many blind mice would see? It's just been amazing what the, what's occurred in the last uh, in the last two decades. Uh, this is an amazingly strong surgical department with a research emphasis, and I think it's done it in uh, in imaginative ways by collaborating outside of the department and reaching beyond its own borders. I think one of the the prime examples of this is uh, Jonathan's role in the recruitment of Chris Palczewski. I think Chris Palczewski did not come to the pharmacology search committee's attention by the usual pathways. Indeed, he had applied for uh, an endowed professorship in the Department of Ophthalmology, and, and uh, Jonathan immediately recognized uh, the potential and strength that Chris could bring to the institution. And, uh, graciously uh, passed his CV onto the, uh, onto the search committee in, uh, in pharmacology. Uh, that has been an extraordinary moment for the visual sciences at uh, Case Western Reserve because uh, pharmacolo as pharmacology has grown by leaps and bounds, so has the visual sciences research center. We have an incredibly strong program in retinal biology, which is grounded in the Palczewski lab, but has ripples spreading out to many other investigators that uh, Chris has either recruited into pharmacology or recruited into ophthalmology or has stabilized here. Um, very recently, Chris was awarded a very prestigious uh, R24 grant in, uh, uh, in visual sciences. And this is partly going to the Department of Ophthalmology. Akiko Maeda is one of the investigators, and the, uh, the benefits of this particular strategy strategic recruitment continue. Now, that's not to say that this is the only leadership. We, I'm delighted to recognize Eric Perlman, who's a director of research for the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, for his leadership and drive in building this program. And I have passed on the paperwork that Dr. Lass sent me for his uh, uh, appointment to the uh, Paige Reinhardt chair, and I'm hoping that the board will concur. Uh, in addition, uh, Ram Nagaraj now holds the Carl Asif uh, Professorship in Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences and Pharmacology and uh, is contributing mightily in his laboratory to the advancement of the center. And of course, Subar Wang, uh, who holds not only an MD but also an MBA, is uh, organizing clinical research in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. And he's the director for the Center of Retina and macular disease at the UHI Institute. So we have a powerful team here that's coming together to, uh, to perform translational research in ophthalmology. Our department is one of the top 10 highest funded eye research institutions in the country. There are 18 basic and clinical science uh, departments involved in vis vision research. And I gotta tell you that this level of collaboration doesn't occur in every institution. We've been able to reach across uh, departmental boundaries. And I'm very proud of the leadership in this institution that has uh, encouraged that and has allowed us uh, to do that. Jonathan told you that there are over $9 million a year in federal funding with uh, associated with the NIH P30 core grant and with their T32. And the training grant has been funded continuously since 1997, which is a real feat these days. 
The, uh, our eligibility for funds from, for, uh, from research to prevent blindness has been an important part of the growth. Uh, this uh, foundation gives over 10 million per year nationally, and CWRU has received nearly 3 million since we became eligible to receive its funds. Uh, we have attracted prestigious uh, individual awards in career development, the Wasserman uh, Award, senior investigators, medical student, and of course the Jules and Doris Stein professorship awarded to uh, Dr. Pikaleva is a real feather in our cap. <laughs> Uh, this reflects the high quality of our researchers, because I don't think these guys are pushovers at that foundation. The accomplishments of the Visual Science Research Center are just a sample of the research engine that's uh, operating in the School of Medicine. We are leaders in educating future physicians and scientists. Our medical students are required to do scholarly work, and many of them come through your laboratories and your clinics to do, uh, to do that. Uh, we are driving basic and translational research. In the recent years, the translational research has become very prominent, and as I put together the renewal application for the CTSA award, I discovered that in 2011, of the grants awarded in 2011, 77% of them had a translational component. So I'm very proud of that, and I'm proud of the fact that we're trying to make a difference in people's lives. We're also working hard to enhance the awareness and reputation of this institution. And every time we break into a top 10, as we are for visual sciences research, that enhances our ability to do that. So before I go, I do want to uh, thank you all for your dedication and commitment to this important work. Uh, you have been prolific in your research efforts. You have been an inspiring example of what is possible when we invest in space, leadership, and recruitment and retention of excellent faculty. And we're going to work very hard to continue this trend. You're a terrific example of the values of collaboration and uh, reaching out within our institution. And I'd like to, to thank particularly John Lass for his leadership in, uh, in this regard. Couldn't have done it without you, John. Thank you.